You say, well, you're not claiming that the Bible is a work of fiction. It's like, don't, don't, that's, a, that's just a cheap objection. That's yeah, not my point. Do you agree with it my or point not, is that it's no. a narrative. And there is surmountable evidence, very compelling, for why the Bible is not fiction. And I don't know what kind of crackpot professors you've been listening to that didn't tell you about that evidence. But if you really want to know the truth, the evidence is there. It's up to you to go research it. We can talk about that later. But go look for it yourself, because it's everywhere. Just use Google, if you really want to know the truth. And everything in a narrative is conditioned by all the rest of the things in the narrative. And it's well known, like if you're a screenwriter, for example. Yes, this is in, in writing. They talk about this. It is well known. For example, there's an old dictum. I don't remember who generated it. Was one of the it was Chekhov's gun, is what we call it. Chekhov's gun. I'm impressed, though, that this guy knows he was a great Russian. To my discredit, I only know it was Chekhov's gun. Chekhov was a writer. I didn't know he was one of the great Russians. So, my hat is off to you, sir, showing my receding hairline. Chekhov's gun is what we call it. And I talk about Chekhov's gun in my video about Vision, the Marvel movie comic character, and why he's like, Chekhov's gun is a thing. And if you're going to, if you want to make Marvel comic predictions, what's going to happen next in the movies? Understand Chekhov's gun, you'll predict the movies accurately. It's a thing. And yes, it is working in the Bible. The great Russians, that if there's a, a rifle lying on a table in the first scene, that it better be used by the end of the second scene, or it shouldn't have been there at all. I argue uh, maybe the end of Act Two is also fine, um, but uh, and that's kind of what we're doing more and more with our with our miniseries today. People want to have they want to see the rifle here, and then it's going to show up three seasons later. We want more long term today, but the same point stands. So there's this coherence. Uh, I'm looking for the rifle in your answer to. This. Yes, yes, Sam. Thank you. Because Jordan makes his arguments first, his defenses first, and then he makes his point at the end. And if I, when I'm monitoring, when you guys are men enough to come on, I will say, uh, Jordan, excuse me, point first and then provide it. We want to know what it is you're going to say, and I promise I will do that. But Sam, I'm also going to ask you to back up your claims, not just, uh, you know, uh, Harvard Yale archetype uh, Ivy League. Us. This question, yeah, though, because I want look, it to be used. Yeah, be agreeable. My That's point right, is, is that it, it isn't reasonable to take a single sentence out of a coherent narrative and say that stands on its own, or it's rarely reasonable. This, he's talking hermeneutics. This is Bible herme hermeneutics. That's what he's talking about. This is stuff that we would talk about when I was at Moody all the time. Bible schools talk about this, how to interpret. Because you have to interpret the word in the sentence and the sentence in the paragraph, and the paragraph in the chapter, and the chapter in the context and, of the entire. And the time of history entire book. You have to do that. Now, you could object, and reasonably so, that there are some sentences that are so blatant that you can't use context to, to what, reverse. paraphrase them, let's say. Reverse. I, I think, think reverse. you also have to give the devil it's, its, it's due. The, the Christian Bible is a developmental narrative, and the beginning has to be read in light of the end. Yes, very true. Okay. Very, very true. Okay. All right. A lot more could be said. He could have had a much meatier response, but he's not a Bible expert. That was pretty good, though. What does that do to Moses' laws of war? Moses' laws of war, he's going to explain in a minute. This is a problem. This is not a narrative. This is instructions. Brett, you're asking a question to someone that's not a Bible expert. He's a psychology expert. You should be asking that question to me. I love you, Brett. I'm going to answer it. I'm going to let you finish. About what to do when you invade a foreign land. And not just any old foreign land. Important to know. When Israel invaded Palestine. The Bible has the answer to that context. Genesis 15, 6. I'm not going to have you invade that land now because they're not bad people. Not bad enough. 400 years are going to be slaved in Egypt, unfortunately, but protected. And then I'm going to deliver them out of slavery in Egypt. Hmm, some God that advocates slavery delivering Israel out of slavery. Uh, hmm, another problem there, Sam. Uh, but I'm, he says, I'm going to have them delayed before they invade Canaan. Because the sin of the Amorites living there will not yet have reached its fullness. God did not want them to go in and just eradicate and burn every man, woman, child, animal, house, everything. God didn't want them to do that to, to people that were just kind of maybe a little bit bad people. God wanted Israel to do that to the worst of people. And when God did that, he wanted that evil gone, 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 so that we could be spoiled, rotten brat children having life as wonderful as we do today, not having to suffer in the living hells, plural, that it was in earth at that time. That's what he's talking about at that time in those specific situations under a theocracy, 
when there would be a prophet that would speak for God, not what we have today, not what we should have today. Under those ancient times, dealing with all kinds of terrible, weird things we didn't understand, God navigating them through how to solve this thing so we could get to a civilized society today. If you intend to... Look, you might not agree with what I said, but it's one way of looking at it. And if you look at it that way, ask yourself if it works in your life. You know, the, the biggest defense for the Bible is not the surmounting archaeological evidence for it, which there is. Go look on that yourself. I'll debate it later. I'll let there are people, men much more qualified than I to have that debate. The real argument for the Bible, as I've written in my own books, Mere Theology, the argument for the Bible's credibility is what it does when you believe it. You don't try to stand in judgment over it. You believe it. You read it and know it and know it, know it, know it, because you're reading it, reading it, reading it. And you put it in your life and you go through 10, 20, 30 years later and you see what that book does to you as a person and you just automatically make the world around you a better place because you're a better person from it. That's what proves the Bible to be real. And the Bible even says that's what proves it real. Joshua 1, 8, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Cross-reference them. You've got to read it and do it. And this is for everything to make your life better and it will be better as a result. That's what it's supposed to do. You read it, then you do it, then you prosper, which is a good thing, by the way, we're learning that, and then you'll have victory over evil. That's what success was, because Joshua was going into a battle to fight evil. Success for Joshua was victory over evil, so that we wouldn't have this hellhole. Take over that land, you kill everybody. Right. You right. better, because um, they were that evil that we don't even know about. In there about um, and he said to him in Genesis 15, 6. Taking the wives yeah, the yourself. Old Testament's a brutal document. Absolutely it is brutal, brutal. So for good reason. Be, I, don't, I don't know that. But see, Jordan doesn't know that, that he can say that to get away with it. And he doesn't um, have enough information. Of the 